Hello, my name is Hannah Hayes, and I'm going to talk to you guys today about pediatric ingestions. And I thought I would try to hit what is common and what is changing and then what is new. So a little bit of each of those categories. Um, first kind of hitting on what I'm seeing kids come uh, to the emergency department and get admitted to the hospital for ingestion-wise every single day. And then we'll get into some of the newer kind of uh, more exciting, fancy things that are coming in. Uh, as I said before, my name is Hannah Hayes. I am the Associate Medical Director of the Central Ohio Poison Center. Um, I'm also an Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine and Pediatrics, and I work at Nationwide Children's as a medical toxicologist. I wanted to start by giving a two-slide overview of the Central Ohio Poison Center. Many of you guys have probably had occasion to call us in the past. Um, what we are is a call center staffed by specially trained nurses and pharmacists who not only undergo rigorous training in poisoning, but they also take a difficult certification exam. And they have 24-hour, um, seven-day-a-week medical backup from a board-certified toxicologist professional callers, so that would be you guys. Uh, if you ever have a super complicated case, you can always consult with that board certified medical toxicologist. We handle about 42,000 exposures per year. Um, we also take calls via the um, national number, so anywhere in the country from any cell phone or landline, you can call us at 1-800-222-1222, and then the call will be routed by your area code to the appropriate poison center. The yellow on this map, just for your information, that is the catchment area for our poison control center. The blue is covered by Cincinnati Poison Control Center. And we're also on Facebook, so uh, check us out, give us a like, follow our page, it'd be great to have your support. So I'm gonna start off today talking about the common ingestion patterns I see in younger pediatric patients. So whenever I get a call from a poison specialist about a child who's being admitted to a pediatric hospital uh, with altered mental status, I would bet that it's either clonidine or buprenorphine. So we'll first talk about clonidine and then other alpha agonists that act similar to clonidine. And when we're done with this portion of the talk, I want you guys to be familiar with the common clinical presentation and also the treatments that we'll use. So clonidine is essentially acting antihypertensive. It acts to lower blood pressure by decreasing your sympathetic outflow from the central nervous system. Part of what we see a lot is kids who get into the medication because their sibling takes it for ADHD. So clonidine is very commonly used for ADHD to help control impulsivity, hyperactivity, help kids wind down for sleep. Um, other medications of this class that I see a lot of ingestions of include guanfacine and tizanidine. So with clonidine, small doses in children can cause toxicity. So a 0.2 milligram tab can cause significant toxicity in a small child. <laughs> Sorry. One thing for you guys to be aware of is that a child who gets a hold of a transdermal patch and starts licking or chewing on it, they can get a whole lot of drug. So if someone in the household has a patch that's designed to release 0.1 milligrams per day and discards it, um, that is a potential for a huge dose. So a 0.1 milligram per day patch contains actually 2.5 milligrams of clonidine, and a discarded patch can actually have up to 70% of that drug left. Um, usually 35 to 50% is left, but up to 70% can be um, on there depending on the person who is using it. So that's an area where kids can potentially get very sick. So the clinical course, symptom onset for clonidine ingestion is usually pretty rapid, within 30 to 90 minutes. So that's one area where it's a little bit different from the buprenorphine that we're going to talk about next. The common things that we see in children are CNS depression, meiosis, 
and sometimes respiratory depression. And so these kids look a whole lot like the opioid overdoses that you guys are seeing every single day. Um, things that are a little bit different in our pediatric patients are that the kids with CNS depression and even some respiratory depression, they can often be stimulated out of it. So most of these kids don't end up needing intubation because all they need you know, is someone to come over, assess them, interact with them, and then they wake up enough to where they can breathe and interact. That's not always the case, but it's often the case. We also see bradycardia, again, from that decreased sympathetic outflow. Some of these kids have hypotension, but I'll tell you, far and away, the commoner vital sign abnormality is that bradycardia. And then sometimes we also see mild hypothermia. So treatment is going to be your ABCs, uh, possibly activated charcoal. It's not always possible because the kids are a little bit sleepy and we definitely don't want anyone to aspirate activated charcoal. Um, atropine for bradycardia. Um, in my experience, our kids tolerate these low heart rates in the 40s and 50s pretty well without any or maybe just a dose of atropine. So you often don't need to give them a whole lot of atropine, and that's different than if you had an older patient, an adult-sized patient with comorbidities who's not going to tolerate that decreased cardiac output as well. And then IV fluids. Um, if I had a kid who was significantly hypotension, I would recommend a, a, a vasopressor after IV fluid administration. We just don't see that significant of hypotension very often to warrant that. Uh, you may be familiar that there are case reports and case series of naloxone providing positive responses to clonidine toxicity. Um, that probably started because clonidine toxicity looks so much like opioid toxicity. If you're going to try this, uh, you probably need to use pretty large doses, so two up to 10 milligrams of Narcan in a pediatric size patient. And I've, I've done that, and I do recommend that if a patient is at the point where they're about to get intubated for a clonidine overdose. But I don't find the response to be consistent or very impressive. So unless I'm at the part of the point with a patient where I think they need intubation, I'm often not recommending naloxone. But I think it's a safe, readily available drug, and it's reasonable to try if you have a critically ill patient. So summary for clonidine, the clonidine presentation mimics the opioid triad plus bradycardia. Our pediatric patients often do have some bradypnea and hypopnea, but you can often stimulate them out of it, out of it with just gentle um, physical stimuli and they won't need intubation. Treatment is supportive. There may be a role for naloxone in larger doses. I also want to talk about buprenorphine. Um, we'll talk about the mechanism of action of that drug. Um, I think it's a mechanism of action that's often misunderstood. And then also we'll talk about the mechanism of action in pediatric toxicity that leads these pediatric patients to have some unique complications that you won't see in your adult patients. So buprenorphine is actually the number one exploratory opioid ingestion in patients less than six. Some of that probably has to do with uh, how available it is. People who take Suboxone have it regularly every day, uh, whereas people who are on opioids often just have them for shorter periods of time. Um, Suboxone also is often flavored, typically orange flavored, so it smells and tastes good, um, which kind of reinforces um, the desire to ingest them for kids. And plus, kids mimic adults that they see. So if they're seeing an adult ingest ingesting Suboxone, they may think that they want to do that too. Um, these medications are often combined with Naloxone. There's different brand names available. I have a picture of Suboxone up right there for you to look at, um, and we'll talk about why that is. So you may have heard buprenorphine des described as a partial agonist antagonist, but what does that mean? So buprenorphine is an opioid that is an agonist at the mu opioid receptors. It binds very tightly. It can actually displace other opioids from the receptor, but it only partially agonizes or partially turns on that receptor. So if a patient had just used heroin, for example, and they take buprenorphine or Suboxone, 
that buprenorphine will displace the heroin from the mu opioid receptors because it has such a high binding affinity. In those cases, it could potentially cause withdrawal. So what's this antagonist business that we always hear described as uh, buprenorphine acting as? It's actually an antagonist at, at kappa opioid receptors. And kappa opioid receptors are thought to play a role in opioid-related dysphoria and psychosis that some people get when they take opioids. So if we're giving buprenorphine, maybe we will bind to the mu opioid receptor, partially turn it on and relieve opioid cravings, and will also prevent some of the dysphoria that some patients get when taking opioids. So the antagonist terminology is not, to not used to describe the naloxone. The naloxone was added to this formulation to prevent diversion. So if I had a patient who was at risk for a relapse and return to, for example, heroin use, if I give them suboxone that contains naloxone in it, if I would hope that they would take it appropriately um, by t putting it in their mouth and you know, having mucosal absorption. In that sense, if they do that, none of the naloxone will be absorbed. They'll get their appropriate uh, oral, subox or oral buprenorphine dose and they'll treat their uh, opioid cravings. If someone decides they're gonna take the suboxone that I prescribed them and solubilize it and IV inject it, the naloxone will prevent a sudden rush of opioid high and they'll actually have some withdrawal. So it's used to prevent diversion. When suboxone is taken as prescribed um, via the mucosal route, the naloxone is not absorbed. So a child who ingests a suboxone film will not absorb any naloxone. Naloxone has less than a 2% bioavailability. So naloxone does not uh, treat or slow the onset of any suboxone or buprenorphine ingestion because it's just not absorbed. So we'll talk about the clinical implications of that partial agonist terminology that I used a minute ago. So as a partial agonist, buprenorphine is generally considered to have a ceiling effect on respiratory depression. So if you look at the buprenorphine line, those orange uh, dots on the graph, you can see the opioid respiratory effect stops and you can continue giving higher and higher and higher doses, but in an adult patient, they won't get higher and higher amounts of respiratory depression. Contrast that with methadone where the respiratory depression just continues to escalate with escalating doses. Problem is that pediatric exposures are different. Unlike adults, in children, fatal respiratory depression is possible. Small doses, even a lick or a taste of the medication, even just a lick of that medication can cause serious symptoms, including respiratory depression. These ingestions are even trickier to treat and diagnose because the symptom onset can be very delayed, up to 18 hours after that ingestion. So it can be very difficult to identify who needs to come to the hospital and who needs to be admitted to the hospital. Um, most urine drug screens will be negative. The opioid screen does not detect buprenorphine because buprenorphine is semi-synthetic and it's not a natural opiate. Um, so you can't rely on your urine drug screen. Here at Nationwide, we do have the ability to detect buprenorphine in the urine, but some of these kids have a low enough amount of buprenorphine that they're exposed to that they won't get a positive urine drug screen, but it's still enough to make them sick. The symptom onset, as I said, can be delayed 18 hours. And some physicians and parents actually believe that the naloxone is protective. So they think, well, they got a naloxone dose so they won't get sick. And to make matters worse, some of the buprenorphine waiver training doesn't include this a discussion about this unique pediatric complication. And so even the, not just physicians, but some of the um, physician buprenorphine prescribers aren't aware of this. So people tend to think that it's a safer drug. And it is a safer drug for someone who's using it for uh, opioid use disorder, but it's not safe in children. So for you guys, if you get a call for about a patient who was exposed to buprenorphine, obviously ABCs in supportive care uh, for Children who are acutely symptomatic, you can give doses of naloxone. 
Um, because the duration of naloxone is so much shorter than buprenorphine, we often need repeated doses or an infusion. Um, but all kids who are exposed to buprenorphine, we recommend a 23-hour op. So if you go on a call of a kid who was recently exposed or even exposed six hours ago, that kid still needs transported to a hospital uh, for admission and observation. So the summary of what I want to take home from uh, about buprenorphine is that children can have a delayed onset of a fatal respiratory depression and that pediatric exposures to buprenorphine should be admitted for 23-hour OBS. I'm going to shift gears and I want to talk a little bit about some patterns that are changing. You all have known about THC probably since you, before you became uh, involved with EMS. But there's a few things about it that are changing and some ways that this uniquely impacts children, and so we'll talk about it. I want you guys to be aware of the possibility for delayed symptom onset after edible exposures, and we'll learn about how pediatric exposures may present differently than adults. So edible use is on the rise. Um, edible um, sales have been increasing. Even you can see the New York Times article from a few weeks ago uh, that says, you know what else has sold well during the pandemic? Weed edibles. Uh, so people are still buying these. People are still using these. Um, marijuana is the number one, edibles are the number one cause of cannabis exposures in children less than 12 years old. What drives me nuts is that the packaging looks identical to real candy. So I've had, in the last few months, I've had three nerd rope ingestions of people who didn't realize that they were just giving kids uh, marijuana edibles. They thought it was like a real nerd's rope. And I, I kind of believe this is true because they gave the kid the thing and the kid ate the whole rope. I mean, it's possible that, that a child also would find this and think it's candy. But I've also just had people get confused or other family members find the edible and not realize that it's medicated. So the top one is like the real nerd's rope. The bottom is the medicated. You can see it says medicated above it if you're looking for it. You can buy these um, packages on eBay. Um, anybody can. You can go on there right now and buy them. Um, and then here's just some other things. You can see the pot tarts in the top right hand. The gummy bears look exactly the same. The, Baked goods in the bottom look similar as well. So one of the problems I run into when kids get into edibles is that their peak THC concentration is del can be delayed so much longer out than if you were smoking it. So if someone were to smoke marijuana, I would expect that they would have um, some clinical effects within three minutes and that peak effects would occur around 20 to 30 minutes later. And that makes it somewhat easy to diagnose if a kid's going to get sick. So it's like, oh, they have the exposure and then bam, then they have the symptoms right after. With ingestions, it can take up to four hours for kids to manifest symptoms. And I put the ranges there up to 60 to 90 minutes for symptom onset, some outliers up to 300 minutes for symptom onset, and then peak effects 120 to 180 minutes, so two to three hours later for typical peak effects. So it can be really delayed in kids. Clinical effects, um, we see a lot of drowsiness and some coma. Um, a lot more drowsiness in kids than we see in adults. Some of that probably relates to dose. When the kids get into this and they find, for example, a candy bar, uh, the temptation is to eat the whole thing um, if they're getting into it. And a whole edible candy bar will have about 10 or more doses of marijuana in there because you just eat, if you're using it recreationally, you would just ingest like one square of the chocolate bar. The kids are getting a really big dose. Um, something that also differentiates pediatric exposures from adults is that they have a lot more ataxia. Um, we see some medriasis, tachycardia, conjunctivitis is a unique complaint at presentation for peds, and that's probably just because no adult would go to the emergency department for red eye after using marijuana. But when people see their kids acting drowsy and they have red eyes, then it tends to be reported. Um, we do see some respiratory depression and respiratory failure. Uh, we see coma as well, which is pretty rare in adults. 
Um, and then up to 5% will have seizures, which is also uh, not common in adults. You can see that figure I put up there is from a paper uh, that was published in, um, the, in JAMA. Uh, it uh, outlines Colorado State pediatric marijuana exposures. The light, uh, lighter blue is poison center cases, and you, you can see how ever since uh, it's been, gone from decriminalized to recreational use legalized to retail establishments, the poison center cases have just gone up. So um, this is a current um, QI project that I'm working on at Poison Control, but for, um, for pediatric edible exposures in kids under six, all kids should be evaluated. About 35 to 45 percent of those kids are usually admitted from the ED, and of those, almost half go to the PICU. Um, so I really uh, try to keep an eye on our management here and recommend our poison specialists refer all those kids to the emergency department. So you may end up getting some of those calls. Um, for your standpoint, supportive care, finger stick, blood glucose, and transport, and then here we'll be doing some of the social history and assessing for neglect um, and helping them with some poison, poison prevention strategies and education. So for THC, um, edible use and pediatric edible ingestions are on the rise. I have, you know, two to four a month admitted here at Nationwide Children's that I see at bedside, and that's, you know, just a small part of our catchment area. Clinical effects can be delayed up to four hours. So, you know, when you talk about a child less than six, if they have ingest a drug that the effects can be delayed for four hours, well, if that's any time around bedtime or nap time, it becomes very difficult to observe them at home. So we recommend referring all those kids in, and that's consistent with major talk society recommendations as well. Children, as compared to adults, are at increased risk of ataxia, drowsiness, coma, and seizures. And then, like I said, children less than six need to be transported. And last, new patterns, I wanted to talk about vaping-related pulmonary illness. We're seeing so much COVID, we're seeing so much uh, fentanyl and fentanyl derivatives, but I'm still seeing uh, Ivali, uh, which is the e-cigarette and vaping-related acute lung injury. Um, this was really big in the news uh, in the middle end of last year, started around July into September of last year when the literature was coming out, and I'm still seeing it in the hospital. So I want you guys to become familiar with the current outbreak of vaping-related illness and then the proposed treatments. So e-cigarettes, I have a picture on the bottom there of all different types of vape pens. Um, they're just these little battery-powered devices. Sometimes they're, they're often they're rechargeable, and they just allow users to inhale aerosolized substances. So that could be like nicotine, or they could put like a marijuana-containing cartridge in there as well. Um, Last year, the CDC and FDA came out with a um, notice that said that there is this unusual outbreak of pulmonary disease associated with these e-cigarette products. The first cases that were seen, I think, in Washington, or at least reported out of there in, in June and July of last year, everyone that had this illness reported using e-cigarette products. Most people report using cannabinoid products. As the months have gone by and we've collected more and more data on this, I honestly think all these are related to use of cannabinoid-containing products. There's a small percentage of people who say that they're not using marijuana and that they only ever vaped nicotine, and they're, but I think those people might be lying because they're really the exception to the rule. Um, a lot of people who vape cannabinoids also vape nicotine, um, but far and away, the kids that I've had are using cannabinoids, and they're using them where they're refilling their own cartridges or they're getting off the street, getting them off the street where they've been kind of illicitly refilled, uh, not by like a manufacturer. The most recent case that I had was a kid who had been getting his cartridges from a manufacturer who um, moved his business to another state, and so he wasn't able to get it 
from him. And so then he started getting it. He said, quote, here and there. But he was getting it from buddies who were you know, doing their own cartridge refilling. And then he started to develop symptoms. So the symptom onset can be days to weeks after use. Um, so, you know, it's not a kid who starts using these and has used it for like a couple days. Sometimes kids will have been using a certain cartridge for like a month. Um, when I try to pin down these patients on how frequently they're using, it's really hard for me to get a threshold of how much they have to use because so many of these kids just kind of vape this like all day throughout the day. So I can't really say that like, these kids aren't sitting down with their buddies and using once a day or twice a day or three times a week for me to say. They just carry this pen around and vape casually all day every day. So signs and symptoms. So what are we seeing? So obviously if it's e-cigarette and vaping related acute lung injury, we're seeing respiratory symptoms. Most of those kids have cough and shortness of breath. Uh, one of the cases that I had that I was pretty sure was a volley didn't have too much of a cough, but he had all the other symptoms. So it's not universal, but almost 100% of them have some respiratory symptoms. What's interesting to me is the amount of GI symptoms. So you know, these, this paper here from the New England Journal said about 43% of cases reported diarrhea. Every kid I've had that had Ivali had kind of like a, this prodrome of diarrhea that may or may not have included vomiting, but pretty much they've all had diarrhea. And then they go on to develop fever and respiratory symptoms. The fever can be a, a little bit tricky. Um, and as you can imagine, the kids who present and have fever often get an infectious workup. Um, but after we've ruled out infections, uh, we know that the fever still is characteristic of the Avali syndrome. So there's no clear improvement with antimicrobials. Some of them end up getting on antibiotics and antivirals and antifungals while we rule out um, infection. Um, many patients have respiratory failure. Almost 90% of them require supplemental oxygen. Every patient that I've had admitted here has been on supplemental oxygen. Um, positive pressure ventilation. So I've had a couple patients on uh, BiPAP or CPAP, and I haven't had anyone intubated, but about a third of cases get intubated. One thing I've noticed is some of these kids end up bouncing back to the emergency department several times. They come in. Um, with, with what looks like a mild respiratory disease. We say, oh, you must have a virus or you must have COVID. Um, and they're sent home with return if instructions and they bounce back two or three times as their illness progresses to respiratory uh, insufficiency or respiratory failure. I feel like when we put the kids on even just a little bit of oxygen, um, I think the last kid I had was 13 and he was on a liter nasal cannula, it really helped take away his work of breathing. So if I had one of these patients, I wouldn't hesitate to put them, or you thought you had one based on the history, I wouldn't hesitate to put them on supplemental oxygen. Um, there's no harm that's gonna come of that. 92% uh, of patients receive glucocorticoids, um, and I've had every patient that I had get glucocorticoids. If I had someone with a mild disease that maybe didn't require supplemental oxygen or didn't have a significant work of breathing, I'd probably recommend against that. Um, but most pa patients end up getting it and it seems to help them. So if you guys have one of these cases or you believe that it could be based on the history, supportive care, they need transport to the hospital and I would use supplemental oxygen to help make them more comfortable. Um, and I'd certainly use it if they had any hypoxia. Once they get here, we'll report the case to the health department. Um, consider steroids. A lot of them end up having a bronchoalveolar lavage to characterize their um, illness further and follow up with pulmonology for lung function monitoring. So for e-cigarette and vaping related acute lung injury, um, this is a new outbreak of severe respiratory illness that causes respiratory failure in a third of patients. The etiology is somewhat unclear, but maybe thought to be related to some of the additives to the uh, vaping cartridges like vitamin E acetate. And treatment is supportive, supplemental oxygen, um, glucocorticoids, and then this is a reportable disease to the health department. <laughs> 
So in summary of our um, chronic and changing exposures, clonidine is a very common exploratory ingestion in kids. Um, it makes sense a lot of their siblings who may be a little bit older than them have ADHD and are taking these medications for impulsivity and sleep. Um, related to clonidine, it also is guanfazine and tizanidine, and they present very similar with an opioid triad-like syndrome, plus or minus bradycardias. Buprenorphine is our number one uh, exploratory opioid ingestion, and these kids, if they have this exposure or concern from this exposure, need admitted overnight um, for a 24-hour OBS because they can have a delayed onset, up to 18-hour delayed onset of significant symptoms, including respiratory depression and respiratory failure, which is, does not occur in adults, but is something that's unique to our PEDS cases. THC, um, edible use is on the rise. It will continue to rise here in Ohio as the um, legality changes. Um, these kids can have some serious symptoms that we don't commonly see in adults, including ataxia, coma, seizures, and respiratory failure. And then Evali, or e-cigarette and vaping-related acute lung injury, um, is something that we're seeing affect a lot of our teenage patients, like I said, even as young as 12 and, as 12 and 13 years old. And that typically presents with a GI prodrome, and then patients develop respiratory symptoms, fever, and fatigue. So treatment for that is supportive with supplemental oxygen. Once we get to the hospital, we'll often start them on glucocorticoids. And that is everything I have for you today. Thank you very much.